Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? John the Baptist is no doubt, and we'll look at that in more detail, no doubt one of the superheroes of the Bible, one of the superheroes of the New Testament. And perhaps it's happened to you within your own home, your own family. You have that person in your life that is a rock. They, they are immovable, unshakable. They never cry. They always are calm, cool, and collected. They've shown no emotion through great difficulties, great tragedies. They've been that rock and that anchor in your life. And then a season comes when you begin to see them break down for the first time ever. Maybe you grew up in that home with a father that said, men never cry, and you finally hit that moment when your father begins to break down. Or perhaps you are always calm, cool, and collected, and yet anxiety or a panic attack hits you, and you're wondering, what's going on here? I love Scripture because it does not hide the weaknesses of the spiritual giants we find in the Bible. And here John the Baptist is going through a crisis to the point that he is questioning if Jesus is the Messiah or not. Are you the coming one or do we look for another? And it's important for us. Maybe you're here and you've kept this outer shell trying to prove to others that you're the spiritual superhero. You never have weaknesses. You never break down. You never go through panic or anxiety or fear. Just know you can lower down those walls. And it's probably going to be much healthier for you and your family and your spiritual family to lower down those walls and be honest and real with one another. What we find in verse 2 and 3 is that unmet expectations are so dangerous. Have you ever gone through a season where you had high expectations and yet they were missed? And now you're struggling. Ah, man, I thought this was going to happen. Perhaps your birthday came and went and you were expecting this grand surprise party. And you thought, oof, they're going to be hiding when I get home. And you get home and nobody's there. Nobody's there. You think, oh, they're going to be hiding. I'm going to go to bed and wake up. And they're, nope, they're still not there. A week later, nobody came. And now these unmet expectations. Your boss calls you in for a meeting. Finally going to get that raise. I've been working so hard. I'm finally going to get that raise. Your boss calls you in to ask about your fellow coworker, saying, I think I'm going to give that guy a raise. What do you think about it? And unmet expectations, they can drive us to a crisis when we're asking God, what is going on? We've heard back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, that John's been placed in prison all the way back in Matthew chapter 4. And John the Baptist has been this biblical superhero from the time he was in his mother's belly, truly until this point. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41, it tells us that when Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, he's in his mom's womb, came to Mary, the mother of Jesus, that John the Baptist leaped in Elizabeth's womb. That the first person to really realize the king of kings was here. The first person to realize the Messiah was here outside of Mary was another baby. An infant. And this is John the Baptist filled with the Holy Spirit from the time he's in his mother's womb. Before Jesus began his earthly ministry, John the Baptist would say in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Before any miracles, before Jesus began his ministry. Later on in this same chapter, in verse 11 of Matthew 11, Jesus would say, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. What a great man of faith. And yet he's struggling here. He's going through difficulty. Are you the one or should we look for another? And John the Baptist was a bold, bold man. And he truly feared God more than any man. And because he feared God more than men, even 
Men in power were fearful of John the Baptist. Let's turn to Mark chapter 6 and we'll be given some more details as to what John the Baptist is going through and why he sent these two disciples to go ask Jesus. Mark chapter 6, as you turn there, I'm going to read an excerpt from William Barclay to show us what's going on for John the Baptist. William Barclay says, Herod Antipas of Galilee, he's the one in charge of the region of the Sea of Galilee, he goes and pays a visit to his brother, another politician in Rome. During this visit, he seduces his brother's wife. He comes home, he dismisses his own wife, and now he marries his sister-in-law, who he lured away from her husband. Publicly and sternly, John the Baptist rebuked Herod for his actions. William Barclay says, It was never safe to rebuke an eastern ruler, and Herod took his revenge. Anything new under the sun? It's not safe to rebuke or talk bad about politicians today, even in our own nation. John was then thrown into the dungeons of a fortress on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which today would be in modern Jordan. In Mark chapter 6, verse 17, it tells us, Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and a holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. What boldness. How many of us would be bold enough the first time we meet a mayor or a governor, we'd say, hey, you're living in sin. you got to get right with the Lord. That's what John the Baptist does here. He meets Mr. President and he says, hey, you're living in sin. What you're doing is not lawful. John the Baptist, he's bold. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. This one who sends the Messiah's presence as an infant. The one who called him the Lamb of God before one miracle. And yet, he's struggling in his faith. And I want to encourage you, if you're struggling in your faith, know that you're not alone. Each of us will go through trials and tribulations and things that just don't make sense. And we'll hit a crisis when we say, God, what is going on here? Jesus, if you're really the Messiah, would you let me rot in this prison? Imagine, it's his own cousin. Because you're the Messiah and you're letting me rot in this prison when this man is living in sin? We're going to go through trials, family. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it tells us, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Jesus, he warns us in John 16, These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And Peter, he went through several trials. We know that he was tried when he ran from Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Lord warned him, hey, you're going to fall here. You're going to deny me three times. But afterwards, hey, come back, encourage your brothers, and do rightly. 1 Peter chapter 1, at verse 6 through 7, it says this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Have you ever been in the midst of a trial that you begin to laugh? Because you know if you stop laughing, you'll start crying. That's what Peter is saying here. Hey, when you go through trials, rejoice. We read earlier, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But what's the purpose of these trials, verse 7? That the genuineness. Of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. These trials reveal to us truly how spiritual we are. 
It reveals how holy we really are. It reveals how much do we really love the Lord. Because when difficulties come, you see the reality of where things are at. Within our marriages, this is not true. When we go through difficulty, now we see how much we love the person and we're going to keep to our vows. It's through the difficulties we find out what we're made of. And when we go through these trials by fire, will our faith be found to praise, honor, and glory Jesus Christ? In the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 22, in the midst of the church's early history, we find this verse. It says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Family, that's what this life is about. Trials, testing, and tribulation. This world is not our home. The rest comes on the other side of eternity. The rest today is found in that relationship and friendship with Jesus Christ. A few weeks later, we'll we'll finish up Matthew 11, but we see there we get rest when we come to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is growing weary in this trial of being in prison for so long, and now he begins to question, are you the one or should we look for another? Again, I love scripture. It does not hide the weaknesses and the failures of its heroes. David's sin with Bathsheba. Moses murdering another one. Moses not really trusting in the Lord. The Bible shows us that the great men of God, these great spiritual giants, they had weaknesses and failures as well. And if we're in that season of weakness, do not allow the devil to now throw a bucket of condemnation upon you. But may we follow John's example. When John was questioning, what did he do? He brought his questions to Jesus. He said, Jesus, what's going on here? Are you the coming one or not? And if you're going through a season of unmet expectations in the season of trials, bring those questions to Jesus. Get that quiet time. Get that time alone and ask, Lord, what's going on here? This is what I expected. This is what I read. This is what I thought. Lord, what's going on here? And perhaps you're here and you've never had that moment of weakness. Don't lie to yourself as Peter lied to himself. If you say, I'll never go through that season of questioning, you're no different than Peter saying, Lord, I will never deny you. These 11 guys, we both know they'll deny you, but Lord, I'm different. I'll never deny you it's not a question of if it is when we go through these seasons that just don't make sense when we don't know or we don't understand and we begin to question bring those questions to the feet of Jesus in Luke chapter 7 verse 20 and 21 it gives us more insight to this conversation between Jesus and these two disciples of John the Baptist in Luke 7 verse 20 It says, when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And at that very hour, he cured many infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. I wonder if he said, answer your question at the end of it all. He does these miracles right here and right now. But then in verse 4 and 5, Jesus answers and says to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You see, Jesus is not the Messiah because he does what we want him to do. Jesus is not our Messiah because he meets our expectations. Jesus is not our Savior just because he saves us from our own foolish decision making. Jesus is the Messiah because he meets the Bible's expectations and the Bible's prophecy when it comes to the coming Messiah. Whether we like it or not, he is the Messiah, but he's the Messiah because he follows the biblical expectations, not just our expectations. What Jesus does is he reminds John and his two disciples about the word of God. 
John, you're going through difficulty. Remember what Scripture says. And here what Jesus does is he quotes several verses in the book of Isaiah speaking and prophesying of the coming one. In Isaiah 29, 18, it says, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see. In Isaiah 35, verse 4 through 6, it says, He will come and save you, and the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. Isaiah 42, verse 6 says, I will keep you. And give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And here's a great example. Maybe this is what John the Baptist was thinking. Messiah, you've come to bring out the prisoners from the prison. Prisoner? Prison house? What's going on here, Lord? What's going on here, cuz? What's going on here, master? But we need to trust in the Lord. Even when it doesn't meet our expectations, we go through those seasons. Lord, this is what I read. What's going on here? One of my favorite moments in the New Testament, Jesus is in a synagogue, and for whatever reason, right, whatever God reason, he's there, and the synagogue begins by a reading of Scripture, So they asked Jesus to read the scripture, and would you have it? He reads Isaiah 61, verse 1. So a mic drop type moment. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And he says, I'm here. He drops the mic, he drops the scroll of you, and he says, hey, I'm here. And they get angry, they are fierce, they drive him out of the synagogue and want to stone him. But each of us will be faced with that trial that shakes us to our core. Perhaps you got the bad news from the doctor. Maybe it's the growing health issue, a death in the family, a financial crisis, mistreatment and injustice, being sexually exploited. Problems with our children, problems with our parents, a failed relationship, a failed marriage, a miscarriage. What is the great difficulty that you will face that will cause you and drive you to your knees saying, Lord, what is going on here? We ought to follow Jesus' example because the only thing that will help us survive that storm of questions is by going back to the word of God. Nothing else will encourage us. Nothing else will give us fulfillment and peace and joy. And if we're honest, we turn to different things when we're going through trials, and they help us for a short moment. Maybe you're going through that trial, and you go to your favorite people, Ben and Jerry. (laughs) And they help you feel better till you finish that pint. And then what happens after you finish that pint? Now the trial comes back, and now you're guilty because you ate a whole pint of ice cream. You're going through that trial, and you you go to the bottle. You're going through that trial, and you say, you know what? I'm going to have a spa day. I'm going through that trial. I'm going to go on vacation. You go through the trial, and many of us, you start just buying things. Your Amazon order goes nuts because you're going through trial, and you're thinking something else will bring me joy and comfort. But it can only be the word. It can only be the word. When things don't make sense, when we're shaken to our core, it is only the word that is the foundation that will get us through the storms of this life. Psalm 19 verse 8 tells us, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 119 verse 9 through 11 tells us, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It is only the word. And if you've been through that season, there's a verse that now you carry for the rest of your life. There's certain scriptures in Ezekiel that they run with me for the rest of my life. Psalm 7, 15, 17, 15, for the rest of my life, these scriptures are close to me because in moments of questioning, the Lord gives them to you as comfort, and now they are monument stones to look back on when the next trial comes. Proverbs, 40, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 
He says, my son, give attention to my words and incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. One last scripture on this, Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Maybe you're in that season right now. Go to the word of the Lord. It's going to be the only shield, the only fortress, the only strong tower that you can run to in this season of what ifs and questioning and Lord, what's going on here? Jesus, he first turns him to the word and now back to Matthew chapter 11 verse 6. Jesus gives John and he gives us another beatitude. Even though it's not on the Mount of Beatitudes, it's an attitude for us to have. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Are you offended by Jesus Christ? Are you offended when he says, if you love anything more than me, husband or wife or children or home, more than me, you're not worthy of me. Does that offend you? There are certain things that Jesus says that offends us, but here within the context, Jesus is asking John, do I offend you because I'm not doing what you want? Are you offended because I'm not doing what you expected of me? Are you offended because I did something you were not expecting? And it's a great question for us. Are we offended when Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do? Are we offended when he does something we weren't expecting him to do? We can think of the prophet Jonah. What a good prophet. Whole entire city gets saved and he's bitter and angry about it. He was offended because God did something he was not expecting. Something he did not want to happen. Charles Spurgeon says, Blessed is he who can be left in prison. Blessed is he who can be silenced in his testimony and can seem to be deserted of the Lord and yet shut out every doubt. John speedily regained this blessedness and fully recovered his serenity. Family, is Jesus our Lord or is he simply your genie? Is he your Lord or is he your butler? Is he your Lord or is he your servant? Is he your Lord or is he simply a business partner? See, if we're honest, sometimes we treat Jesus as our butler. Go fetch me my slippers. Go fetch me my kids. Go fetch me a job. Go fetch me more money. Go fetch me more comfort. We treat him as our servant. Sometimes we treat him as a business partner. Lord, I'm going to serve you for these next two years. But at the end of those two years, I expect a beautiful wife at the end of it all. Lord, I'm going to do this for you, but you got to bless my business. Lord, I'm going to do this for you, but you got to bring my kid back home. We can treat him as our business partner, and yet we know scripturally that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And all of crea creation, past, present, and future, all of creation in heaven above and on earth and in hell below will bow down to him and call him king. King of kings and lord of lords. Are we offended when he doesn't do what we tell him to do? When we say, Lord, I, I don't know if you know what's going on, but I got a pretty good handle on the situation. Why don't you just listen to me? Blessed are those who are not offended because of me. I have a few scriptures here that are so important. Job. Here John the Baptist, he's going through a trial that doesn't make sense to him. If there was ever a man that went through a trial that made no sense, it is Job. And yet Job is a part of a movie and a, 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 a battle between God and Satan and he can't even see it. Satan comes in and says, hey, Job, he loves you because you give him everything you want. And God says, nope, Job loves me because he loves me. You can take everything away from him and he's still going to love me. In Job 13, verse 15, he says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. What faith? Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Is that, is that our mindset? Because if we're honest, many of us as believers do not have a biblical view of death. For many of us, we think death, no, that, that's, that shouldn't happen to us as believers. Or that should happen when we're 100 years old and it's going to happen in our sleep, when we're in the middle of a jacuzzi and then he's going to call us home. 
Got to be this perfect death process. No, death is, is, is the doorway into everlasting life. We sing that at times. And every generation has to go through death to see Jesus face to face. Except one generation will be blessed with the rapture. I think that's going to be us. But if not, millions of believers before us, the only way they got to see their Lord and Savior is by going through death. Do we have a biblical view of death? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Daniel chapter 3 verse 18, we have these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These Jewish men that were put into a trial simply because they obeyed the Lord. Just like Job. Job's in a trial because he obeyed the Lord. John the Baptist, he's in a trial because he obeyed the Lord. The disciples, they went through the storm because they obeyed the Lord. So trials will come even when we obey the Lord. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the king puts this enormous idol. He says when there's music, everybody bows down. Everyone bows down except these three boys. We know that there are many Jewish men that have also been abducted and are in Babylon. So they have other Jewish brothers that they're bowing down, but these three men are bold. They are brought before the king. There's a fiery furnace that was their form of execution. And they tell the king, our Lord can deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. But if not, we will still trust in him. But if not, we will still stand for righteousness. One last man, the greatest of men, Jesus was put in a trial because of his obedience. In Luke 22, verse 42, when he's facing the cross, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's in so much stress and turmoil that his blood vessels and sweat glands both burst and now he's sweating blood and yet he prays, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Is he our Lord or is he our genie? Is he our commander and our king, or is he simply our butler and business partner that we fire when he doesn't do what we want him to do? These great trials, they prove the genuineness of our faith. We come back to Matthew 11, verse 7, verse 7 through 10, and maybe we're here and we think, Lord, what's up with the order of things that are happening here? Because in verse 7 through 10, after the two disciples leave it tells us Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John what did you go out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken by the wind but what did you go out to see a man clothed in soft garments indeed those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses but what did you go out to see a prophet yes I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Many of us, we crave an attaboy, an girl. We crave a, hey, I'm proud of you. You're doing a good job. You're doing awesome. And we should encourage and exhort and build one another up. But if there is a, ever a moment where we think, Jesus, why don't you give John a good job, man? And yet, the Lord wanting to grow and test John's faith, he waits till the disciples leave to now talk about how incredible John the Baptist is. And though we may see John in a bad light because he's doubting Jesus, Jesus now turns around and defends John the Baptist in the midst of the multitudes. Sometimes we can get so fearful with what people think about us that it causes us to crumble and fold. Focus on your character, and the Lord will take care of your reputation. John the Baptist, and it's beautiful. when you, It's weird when you say it. Of uh, men born of women, there's no one greater than me. That's weird when you say it. But to have Jesus be the one to boldly proclaim this, how amazing is that? Take care of your character, and the Lord will take care of your reputation. Jesus turns around and he defends John the Baptist in front of the crowds of this great man of God. He says in verse 10, he's repeating what Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says. To the crowds, he says, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. 
And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 40, verse 3, speaks of John the Baptist. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In ancient times, before a king would come into a new city, if there wasn't a road big enough for the king and his entourage and his parade, what would they do? They would literally build a road to get him there. And then there'd be a messenger before them saying, the king is coming. Behold, the king is coming. And what Jesus is saying here is that John the Baptist is that herald. John the Baptist is that messenger. He's backing up John. He's saying that he's a great man, that he had a strong countenance, that he had strong foundation, that he was not easily shaken like so many pastors and ministers are. John the Baptist, he was a tough man living in the wilderness. When you go home, Google Map, don't do it now. When you go home, Google Map the Judean wilderness. And it's just desert. It is just barren desert to the point the only food he could eat was honey and grasshoppers. Hey, you want to come serve the Lord? We got honey and grasshoppers. That's what we got to eat. We got a family dinner tonight. Thank God we won't be eating honey and grasshoppers. David Guzik, he gives a few S-letter words for John the Baptist. He says, John the Baptist was steady. He was not shaken easily like a reed. Men, how we need men of strong character. Do you stand by the word of God when it's convenient? Or do you stand by the word of God when it's difficult, when it's hard? There are many pastors today, they once had a certain stance on sin, sexual sin, homosexuality, drunkenness. And over time, they begin to shake and water down the truth of the word. John the Baptist was sober in that he lived a disciplined life. He was not in love with the luxuries and the comforts of this world. John the Baptist was a servant. He was the prophet of God. John the Baptist was sent. He was sent as the special messenger of the Lord. John the Baptist was special in that he could be considered the greatest under the old covenant. And finally, John the Baptist was second to even the least in the kingdom under the new covenant. In verse 11, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. There's a lot of people born of women. Everyone is born of a woman, even those 2023. 20, everybody is born of a woman. And what Jesus says here is that of every person that's ever lived, no one's greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is saying the most immature baby believer is better off than John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was the greatest of the old covenant. He was beginning to see the new covenant and proclaiming the new covenant. But we who are living in the new covenant are better off than John the Baptist. And if we're honest, many of us, I'll just speak about myself. When I read of Moses talking with God face to face as a friend. When we read of Moses, his face glowing. And he's, here, he's watching the burning bush. When we see Joshua talking with the commander of the armies of the Lord. When we see these great moments of faith, we can be jealous of it. And yet Jesus is saying, no, 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 friend. We are better off than these men from the old covenant. You see, in the Old Testament, you would have one or two people at a time that would have the Holy Spirit upon them. Each of us, if you're a believer here, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Each of us, we've been gifted the whole Word of God, God's full CAT scan. We don't just see half of it or just the first five books. We're blessed with all of it. And Jesus says, hey, if you're in the kingdom of heaven, if you're in this new covenant, you are better off. Than John the Baptist. And if John the Baptist was able to have such boldness and such a ministry before the new covenant, what ought we be doing for him? What should we be doing for him? What should we be capable if we're pressing into him and following him and being obedient to his word? Verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent they take it by force. 
Jesus speaks of the truth that we will endure violence simply because we're part of the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist, he's in prison. He's about to be beheaded simply because he was a part of the kingdom of heaven and stood for righteousness. And for millennia, believers have gone through violence simply because they proclaim Jesus as Lord. We should be ready for that as well. We've been blessed. We've been born into a bubble in all of history where we can be here and have a church service and we're not fearful that they're going to grab us and drag us off to prison. But we should be ready. I encourage you, be bold, sharing your faith with unbelievers, with believers, with coworkers, with strangers, because I believe that's going to strengthen your faith for when the trials and the violence comes. Verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come, and he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Here, Jesus, he says that, John the Baptist has come in the spirit of Elijah. That, that same tenacity, that same fierceness, that's the same spirit of John the Baptist. And now afterwards, during the seven-year tribulation, we believe John the Baptist will come back to earth and he'll be one of the two witnesses proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. Verse 16 through 19, he says, But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling their, to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What is the Lord speaking of here? He's saying that there's children playing and they're trying to play pretend. So first they say, hey, let's play pretend wedding. So they played the flutes, but they said, hey, we don't want to play that. Then the kids said, all right, we'll go to the other end of the spectrum and let's play funeral. I don't know how many kids play funeral, but this is what Jesus says, right? Let's play funeral. And they started, but nobody wanted to mourn or lament. Jesus said, you guys can't pick. You, you don't choose. First you talk garbage about John the Baptist because he doesn't eat and you say he's a demon. And now I come eating and you say that I'm a glutton and a wine bibber. What's going on here? It's like every man here, if you have a wife or a fiancé or a girlfriend, you've been there. Hey, honey, what are you in the mood to eat? You pick. All right, let's get pasta. Nah, not pasta. All right, let's get barbecue. No carbs there, just meat. Nah, not barbecue, right? It's like, what, what's going on here? Oh, well, you, you pick and choose. And what Jesus is saying here is that you are making excuses to not come and submit to the kingdom of heaven. You're looking for any excuse to not just accept the true message of the word of God. And we, all, we were all once there making every excuse possible why we couldn't follow the Lord, why we couldn't go to church, why we couldn't trust in Jesus. And that perhaps we have friends like that today. The friend that says, the Bible, you can't trust in that. It's a bunch of guy, men, telling men, and we've played telephone before, and the message gets watered down. You can't trust in that. So what do you do? You send them a bunch of videos, PhDs, doctors, whole entire classes, hours and hours of literature and messages from guys way smarter than me, telling us why we could trust in Scripture, and they go, nah, I'm still not going to do it. It's like, I'm answering you. I'm giving you what you've asked, and still you don't want it. And here Jesus is just revealing to us there's some people that they're going to look for any excuse to not submit and not trust in the Lord. But then what does he say at the end of verse 19? I love this sentence. But wisdom is justified by her children. Wisdom is justified by her children. Our decision-making process, was that a good decision or not? I don't know. But in a month or two months or three months or five years... We'll be able to see if that was a good decision or not. Wisdom is justified by her children. The fruit of our life reveals if we're walking in wisdom or not. Wisdom is justified by her children. And truly the only life of faith that leads to so much blessing is living a biblical lifestyle. Even if an unbeliever would adopt all of Proverbs, they would live a better life than the majority of the world. 
because wisdom is justified by her children and wisdom is found in the person of Jesus Christ and in the word of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, it tells us, he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And here there's a biblical truth given to us. The greater our privilege, the greater our responsibility. The greater our privilege, the more we know of the Lord, the more we know of His Word, the more we know of His will, the more we will be held responsible for. Sodom and Gomorrah, they did not have any great miracles in front of them to lead them to repentance. Their messenger, their quote-unquote righteous man was Lot. And nobody likes Lot. I don't know anybody that likes Lot. What's your favorite Bible character? Nobody ever says Lot. Nobody ever says Lot. Because Lot could not save his own wife. Lot could not save his own son-in-laws. The moment they get out of Sodom and Gomorrah and they're in safety, Lot's daughters get him drunk and commit incest with their father two nights in a row. Sodom and Gomorrah, their great prophet, was a sinful man that I would not think he was a believer unless Peter told us he was a righteous man. Capernaum, on the other hand, talk about a messenger. Capernaum had Jesus Christ himself. Jesus adopted Capernaum as his headquarters and as his hometown. In Capernaum, this is where he would call Matthew, the tax collector, to come and follow him. In Capernaum, all the miracles we've read so far, many of them were there in Capernaum. John and James, Peter and Andrew, he called them there in Capernaum. And this town and the surrounding towns around Galilee saw so many of Christ's miracles. They heard so much of Jesus' word, and yet they would not receive him. And Jesus says, as Hispanic parents do, prepárate. Get ready. I gave you all of this truth. I gave you so much of the word. I gave you all these miracles and yet you would not repent. Sadly, that could be many of us here this morning. We know so much of the word. We know so much of his will. We know every Bible story. We could, we could teach a Bible study. But we refuse to repent. We refuse to surrender our will to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And what scripture tells us is that we will be held responsible for the amount of God's word that we know, for the amount of truth and love that we've been exposed to, the great privilege we have of knowing so much of Jesus Christ and his word, there will be an equal responsibility for it when we see him face to face. Every once in a while you'll get that person that says, what about that one Indian that's in the middle of nowhere on an island and no one shared the gospel with him yet? What about him? The Lord's saying, hey, I'm a fair God. I'm a just God. And each of us, our responsibility is going to be connected to how much of the Lord and his word we know. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12. And in Luke 12, Jesus gives us a great parable. A frightening parable, depending on which side of this parable you are living in. Luke chapter 12, verse 43 In verse 42, it begins, Jesus says, Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his master will make a ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, 
My master is delaying his coming. And now he begins to beat the male and female servants. And he eats and drinks and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. And at an hour when he is not aware. And will cut him in two. And appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet he committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him Much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. It's a frightening verse 48. How many Bible teachings have we been exposed to? How many good Bible teachings have we been exposed to? How familiar are we with the will of the master? And yet are we preparing ourselves to do according to his will? It's not enough to just come to church. We need to go home and apply it. The wise man who built his house on the rock is not just the one that hears these things of mine, of Jesus, but it is the one who hears them and does them. We will be held responsible for every Bible study we've heard, every truth of God's word, every time a believer displayed the love and grace and mercy of Christ from him to us, we're going to be held responsible for that. And to whom much has been given, from him much will be required. Are we ready for that? If not, let's start getting ready today. Repent, get right, and begin to do his will. James 3 verse 1, it, it's a warning for me. For any teacher says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. If we're given much privilege when it comes to the word and knowing Christ and knowing his will, then we have a great responsibility to do something with it. Worship team, if you guys would come up, we'll close here. I don't know which of these two individuals you are. As we read it, I think there's two individuals here. Perhaps you're going through that trial right now. You're dealing with sickness in your family. You're dealing with death injustice, loss, and you're saying, Lord, what's going on here? I encourage you, as we saw from John the Baptist, first take that quiet time to spend with the Lord and then go to the Word. Only the Word is going to give you that peace. Only the Word is going to give you that joy. Only the Word is going to sustain you in that moment of weakness. And now the next great warning for us is how we've been given so much of God's word, so much of the truth of the gospel, so much of the love of the gospel, and yet we are like these cities who refused to repent. On the Sea of Galilee, there's still one ancient city that is still in existence and thriving and flourishing. It's the city of Tiberias. When we go to Israel, we get coffee there, we hang out there, there's restaurants there. Tiberias, we don't see any warning. We don't see any rebuke. And they're there on the Sea of Galilee. But every other city we visit, but do you know what we visit? The ruins of that city. We visit a bunch of old rocks that are all piled on top of each other. That's what we go visit. What will our lives look like? Will we be thriving and growing because we're obedient to the Lord? We're obedient to his word? We're obedient to his will? Or will we stay in our stubborn state saying, I will not surrender? I'm not willing to surrender. Whether you come not eating like John the Baptist or whether you come eating like Jesus, I'm not going to surrender. I encourage you, surrender this morning. Surrender this afternoon, 20 minutes afternoon. That we would surrender and say, Lord, my whole life is yours. Both living and dead, my life is yours. Romans 12, I am that living sacrifice. I just want to be holy and pleasing to you. My business, my work ethic, my family, my relationships, my life, my death. Lord, it's all surrendered to you. So hey, let's all stand. We'll close in worship. If you need prayer, there's pastors up front. Just because you come up for prayer doesn't mean you're in the midst of crisis. You can come and pray for someone else in the midst of crisis. You could come and pray just for the week. But if you are going through that crisis, if you are questioning your faith, if you don't know if you're ready for death, I encourage you, come.
pray with one of the pastors. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, how it's, Lord, applicable to us, Lord, for the end of time, Lord. We thank you so much for it. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. Lord, you don't shun us. You don't send us away, Lord. How you want to answer those questions. You're not fearful. You're not afraid of those questions, Lord. And Lord, if anyone here, they've just been receiving the condemnation of the enemy. Lord, if anyone here has been just trying to deal with all these issues and this crisis, these questions all alone, Lord, we pray that they would lay those burdens at your feet now, Lord. Lord, that they would lay down all the weight, all the what-ifs, all the unmet expectations. Lord, help us to lay that at your feet. God, we thank you for being such a loving God that you would want our problems and our questions and what ifs, Lord. What a loving God you are, Lord. Lord, help us to encourage one another, to stir up one another. And Father, we do pray if anyone here does not know you, if anyone here does not know that they know that they know that they know you, Lord, I pray that they would pray with someone today. So Lord, we just love you. Again, Jesus, we thank you for your death, your sacrifice, your resurrection. Thank you for being there in the throne room of God, interceding on our behalf right now. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.